When we talk about healthcare, you may immediately think of human healthcare products, but there is another subset of the pharmaceutical sector that could be worth a look. Pet care. Joining us now to discuss is Jared Ablis, VP of Portfolio Research for TD Asset Management. Great to have you back on the show. Thanks for having me back on. Uh, I think pets, interesting topic. Who doesn't love uh, a puppy, right? right. Um, I think, you know, there's, there's now 60% of Canadian households that uh, own a pet. Uh, so a lot of us are familiar with vet bills and that money goes to somebody. Uh, I think the other reason that's interesting to talk about this is it's got a lot of hallmarkers of what I would call a, a very quality industry. Uh, and I brought a couple charts to just kick it off from the, from the hop, a little game that I was kind of in my head calling uh, animal health or human health. Okay, so uh, let's, yeah, let's play the game of animal yeah, health yeah. or human health. Let's throw it up in the audience here. So what are we looking at? Yeah, so we got three lines on the chart, uh, the green, yellow, red. Uh, this is sales per share. Uh, what you've got is one animal health company, which is the largest animal health pharmaceutical in the world. Uh, that's Zoetis, US-based. And the other two lines are the largest non-obesity uh, human pharmaceutical companies in the world. That's Merck and Johnson & Johnson. Um, so first one, sales per share. You've got green outpacing uh, the yellow, outpacing the red. Uh, it is an animal health segment. So if you had guessed green is Zoetis, you'd be correct. Uh, two things to notice, obviously outgrowing over the last five years, sales per share, uh, but also a more linear trend. And if you flip to the next chart as well, uh, I've got return on assets here, same three companies, same three colors. You've got Zoetis in green, uh, Merck in yellow, and Johnson Johnson in red. Again, impressive uh, for Zoetis out of animal health. You're generating the highest return on assets and the steadiest. All right, let's dig in a little bit deeper on this graph, this return on assets. Why are animal health companies managing to outstrip uh, human health care companies in that space? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. It's interesting specifically because Merck, the company that's in the yellow, uh, they sell literally the largest drug in the world, full stop. Uh, it's a cancer drug, Keytruda, next year expected to be 30 billion in sales from one product. Uh, the obvious question is how do you get more efficient with your assets than that, uh, 30 billion from one drug? And really I'll give you the answer I guess in, in, in three folds. Um, you know, it's a consolidated market, four players, top four players have 65% of market share. What that means is there's very little patent risk in animal health. Uh, in human health, you've really got a treadmill where you work super hard to get an asset to market. You, you sell it for as long as you can, usually 10 to 12 years. Then your patent expires. A generics manufacturer comes in, reverse engineers the pill or the shot, sells it for pennies on the dollar and collapses the profit pool. That's what Merck, for example, will have with Keytruda in 2028. They lose their patents there. So it's, it's a constant treadmill they're working. That's one thing. There's less of that patent risk in animal health. Uh, second thing, it's, it's a non-human, and, and I guess third thing as well, uh, it's an out-of-pocket market. What that means is there's no insurance uh, you know, pressures leaning on you for cutting prices and things like that. And out of uh, a human, non-human uh, market, what that means is that you know, there's, there's no, uh, the, the degree of red tape, we'll call it, is much less in the development process. Uh, if you throw up the next chart there, this is just showing uh, drug development timelines Human health on the top, animal health on the bottom. A lot to read, I'll just kind of walk you through it. Like you've got drug discovery on human health. It takes three to five years to discover a new molecule. That's the chemistry in the lab happening. Then you've got your preclinical testing. That's mice and rats, you do the testing. You file, you get to phase one, then you run phase two, phase three. Those are all human trials. And then finally, you can file it and get it approved 12 to 15 years later. Animal health, much leaner process. You get through it in six to eight years. And not only is it the timeline that's different, but in human health, if you work through drug discovery, preclinical testing, filing, you get to phase one. On the chart, it looks like you're halfway through the battle, but actually at that point, you're still only 10% likely to get that drug approved. So it's very rigorous and not to the same degree in animal health. Much easier process. Okay, so that's return on assets and some of the fundamentals there. You also showed higher sales growth than human health. What, is, what are the drivers there? Yeah, yeah, maybe I'll flip to the next chart here. I brought a couple here as well. Uh, the first factor is really growth in pets. Um, I've got uh, a slide here if we have it. Yeah, there it is. Uh, on the left, you've got pet populations versus human populations. That's humans in uh, orange, pets, uh, cats in green, dogs in blue. Since the year 2000, uh, obviously choppier data points on cats and dogs. That's just because it's uh, owner reported rather than a, a steady census number. Um, but really the driver of cats and dogs outgrowing uh, humans in the U.S. is the lifespan, which is on the right side. Uh, that's cats and dogs lifespan increasing by 18, 19% since 2000 uh, versus humans about 4%. 
Uh, that's like from 12 years to 14 years roughly for, for a cat or a dog. Um, so very interesting. I think there's a couple drivers to that. Um, one of it is just it's a very under medicalized area uh, still. It's, it's a $45 billion global market, which is less than 5% of human health, and even though it sounds large, less than 5% of human pharmaceuticals, uh, which means there's a lot of green space. Uh, Zoetis is an innovation leader. They're talking about the next five, six years developing products for kidney disease, for heart disease, for, for cancer. Uh, which are all brand new markets for cats and dogs, uh, but obviously very lucrative in humans. Uh, so that's kind of the white space that, that gives you upside runway. And then the other factor is, you know, there's, there's the older generation, which probably think of pets just as that, pets, uh, but now half of pet owners are millennial and Gen Z, which much more tend to think of it as part of the family, willing to spend whatever it takes to keep them healthy. So all those factors kind of combine to, to drive above human health growth rates. Yeah, very interesting trends there. Zoetis obviously uh, factors large in the conversation when we're talking about pet health care. What, what does the rest of the landscape look like? Yeah, it's very consolidated, as I mentioned. If you throw up the last slide there, uh, it just got market share on the right. Uh, Zoetis is the big chunk, 23%. Uh, then you've got Merck at 19. Um, that is the same human health Merck. It's actually a conglomerate, got an animal health business in there. BI is Beringer Ingelheim, again, a conglomerate, human health, uh, animal health. Privately, t privately held it, uh, and then Alanco at number four, 13%. That is the other largest uh, publicly traded player. Um, I've got some of the pure play charts on the left side, Zoetis, Alanco, and then a tail of others. Uh, I think the story here is there's, there's a couple that have lagged. There's a couple that are kind of in the middle. That's, that's pharma-like performance. And then at the top, you've got Zoetis. The reason it's been there and been able to hold that position is it's an innovator. It's led the market. I mentioned you know, the cancer and, and things that might be coming. Uh, it just did that two years ago, created a brand new market with osteoarthritis pain medicines for cats and dogs. Uh, and before that, it had done the first uh, triple parasiticide, fleas, ticks, worms. Uh, so a lot of innovation. And this is a market with real brand power since it's consolidated. Uh, which means typically your first move advantage does pay off. There is a flip side to the coin. Zoetis spun out of Pfizer in 2013. Uh, Elanco didn't spin out of Eli Lilly until 20, 2018. So the longer you have on market, the more dedicated animal health research you can do and the more interesting uh, uh, drugs that, that are coming to market. So there is competition coming, but generally a market where leaders should remain leaders. And I think maybe just last thing to put a bow on it, if I think of my overall pharmaceutical coverage, uh, I think you've got you know, large cap pharmaceuticals like the Merck and Johnson & Johnson, uh, which are typically very defensive. Uh, you know, in a hard landing scenario, they would be the ones that catch a bid. Um, then you've got a group of the biotech stocks, which are generally unprofitable, very torquey to rates. Uh, so that's that kind of segment. And then you've got the more secular, obviously quarterly bumps along the way, but more secular stories. We've talked about obesity extensively. Um, and I would also lump in the now, you know, hopefully more well understood animal health. So the animal health obviously is a lot working in its favor. What would they be the biggest risk for the space? You mentioned competition. What else could it be? Yeah, competition is the big one, um, specifically for Zoetis. Elanco has a couple products challenging its, its key uh, markets. The other one is just through COVID, we had a big puppy boom where a lot of people were adopting pets, staying at home. It's been very choppy since then. There's been people surrendering their pets. They just didn't have the time for it anymore. Uh, and then vet visits. There's a lot of vets that burnt out through the pandemic. Uh, so the vet visits have been down. There's just not enough capacity there. So those are kind of the limiters on the story.